Hello and welcome to the first video of this series and of the channel itself. Uh, what the series is going to be about, we're going to look at a famous book by Richard Retty, Masters of the Chessboard. Now, the reason for this is whenever people ask how they can, how can I improve at chess, they're often given a few different pieces of advice. Tactics is always given. Um, but also studying the classics is given quite often. And the book which often goes hand in hand with this advice to study the classics is Richard Vetti's book, Masters of the Chessboard. Oh, there are a lot of other books that present classics with more modern analysis. However, Vetti's book has the advantage in that it is simply a free book in the public domain, and it, it lists all the classics with a, quite a good analysis. So I figured it would be useful to go through the games in this book, looking at Vetti's analysis and also modern theory today and some of the engine lines even, um, to help learn from these classic games. Now as a disclaimer, I am still an improving chess player myself, I'm by no means a master, far from it, and this video course is as much to help me learn and me to study the classics as it is to show these classics to you, whether you're looking to learn from them or to just be entertained by them. So we start off this video series by looking at the games of Adolf Anderson. Um, he was considered the strongest player in the world until Morphy and later Steinitz came along. Um, Anderson is playing with the black pieces. His opponent, playing with the white pieces, is Jacob Rosanes. Um, Rosanes was a famous German mathematician and a well-respected chess master. And we've actually got two games of Addison's uh, he's against Jacob Rosales. So, without further ado, let's look at the game. Rosales plays e4, e5, f4. What would more would you expect from the romantic area of chess than the King's Gambit? And even better, d5. Anderson gambiting, gambiting a pawn straight back with a fault be a counter gambit. Just what you'd expect from the romantic area. Now, the idea of this gambit is that after white takes and black pushes e4, this e4 pawn is a bit of a thorn in white's side. It, it's, um, it's taking space, it's stopping white from developing freely. And the main aim of this opening is that black gambits this pawn, sorry, gambits a d5 pawn, in the hopes of getting its pieces out as quickly as possible. So he's typing for a bit of a development lead, a bit of initiative. Um, it's worth noting that white can't take on e5 because they would lose immediately to queen h4 check. g3 to defend, queen e4 check, picks up the book. So, Rohan is a respected chess master, took on d5. And Anderson, as you'd expect, played e4. And now, Rohanna's plays bishop b5 check. Now here, Retty writes about how this move was characteristic of the old-time players, where the game was played not considering the positional qualities of chess, but instead just trying to get some material advantage or some obvious mating attacks. He writes about how in today's uh, opening, it, with today's players, with a modern player, they are aiming to control the center, and that's the main struggle of the opening, the center. And therefore, most modern players will instead play d3, hoping to try and remove black's dominating pawn on e4. However, in this game, as was customary at the time, white instead tries to remain ahead of pawn. He hopes to keep his pawn advantage, his sole pawn lead, by forcing black to play c6 so he can trade off his weak pawn here because this game this pawn would almost certainly be taken later on in the game so black responds blocking the check d takes c6 knight takes c6 now here vetti writes that usually black takes back with the b pawn which wins a tempo on the bishop and Looking at most Grandmaster games available on the chess.com and Lee Chess opening uh, database, 
most masters do take back with the pawn, except for Anderson, who has taken back with the knight on quite a few games. And most of the games played by masters where knight takes c6 is played has been by Anderson himself. And he does score fairly well with it. White develops, knight c3, attacking the pawn, and black def uh, develops as well, knight, C knight f6, defending the pawn. And then white plays queen e2, attacking this pawn again. Now here, Retu writes that white would have been far better moving the d-pawn, or maybe even to d3. Um, just as they should have done at the start, really, in hoping to try and make up for the backward development and to also control the centre. But instead, White continues to try and play for as much material advantage as possible, hoping to capture a second pawn. Now, Black is quite justified, Retty writes, in not defending this pawn. Instead, on focusing on continuing Black's development and Reddy says that this is because that the more pawns are eliminated from the board, the more lines that are open as a result. And if there's more open lines, black, who will have a lead in development, will be at an advantage. And this is what black does. Bishop c5, giving his pawn away for free. White accepts the pawn, and then black castles. Here, the threat is rook e8. So... Black's bishop isn't actually hanging after black castles because if white takes, we've got rook e8 winning the queen because the queen's pinned to the king. So, okay, so black castles, Rohanas takes on c6, b takes c6, and then Rohanas plays d3, defending this knight. Um, no. The engine line is knight takes f6 check, forcing Anderson to either take back with a g-pawn, ruining his structure, or to take back with the queen. And in this instance, uh, black cannot now play rook e8. So if white develops, rook e8 is not an option because white will just take it. However, after a normal developing move like this, black can then play bishop g4 pinning the knight to the queen. And now rook e8 is an option again because it will be defended by the other rook. And here, white has no choice but to move their queen and the rook check will still, con will, will still come. Black will still check with rook e8, forcing white to move their king to d1 or f1. Meaning that essentially you could have a fully developed black army with white's army undeveloped and a king stuck in the center. So although this is the engine line and the engine says that knight takes f6 is actually the best option that white has, it's completely understandable why white would play d3 to defend the knight. Betty, uh, sorry, Anderson plays e8 anyway, developing the, the rook, pinning the knight to the queen, and then white plays bishop d2. And Vetti says that White's playing this to quite clearly attempt to castle queenside in an attempt to guard his king against any potential danger. However, even though White intends to castle queenside, the pawns that White has already taken has opened up the files to the king and to the queenside. So it's not really that safe. Anderson takes on e4. D takes e4 and bishop f5, utilizing the pin on the queen and the king. Johannes defends the pawn, e5, and then queen b6. And just look at this. Just, just look at this board. We have the bishop attacking down here, the queen attacking here, queen and bishop attacking here, the rook. And this rook is about to go into an open file as well. Anderson's army is fully developed and adding a huge amount of pressure. Anderson's pieces can't really improve that much, but they're already developed already. White's pieces aren't developed at all. And in the next few moves, when White does develop his pieces, Anderson's using that time to move his pieces in 
to into the attack. He's preparing for an amazing meeting attack. And you see here white castles because the threat is bishop takes g2 and queen takes or the threat is simply queen takes b2 so white castles defending b2 with the king and adding another defender to the knight and getting his king to safety or although it's not that safe as we'll see and here anderson makes one move improving his position bishop d4 immediately attacking the b2 pawn threatening mate and aiming his bishop straight at the king's side like there's no real defenders around this king it's the bishop is perhaps defending the queen isn't defending yet it needs it can get into defense but it needs the time to do it and anderson's not going to give him the time so black for threatens mate which Reti writes forces a weakening or weakening of um, White's king side. Rook a b8 again threatening mate because the bishop also blocks as well, and this forces another weakening. And now here Anderson plays a nice quiet waiting move. And this is very much in Anderson's style. Reti says that. Anderson very often makes these quiet waiting moves and just to prepare a brilliant combination. And this combination in this game is completely overlooked by um, by his opponent, Rohanis. Now, the bishop isn't actually hanging. If white takes, then there will be a very nice little mating combination, which I'll give you a second to pause the video to see if you can find. Okay, so the mate is queen takes d4, and the threat is queen a1 check. The only way to stop the mate on a1 is bishop c3, queen takes, and queen c2, queen takes. So again, the bishop isn't really hanging, and Anderson's played this rook d8, which turns out to be a very useful preparing moves it's what gives anderson the mate in the very end and white plays knight f3 attacking this bishop not quite seeing anderson's plan already writes that if white had seen anderson's plan it had played king b2 although already does say that black still would have won quite fast with bishop e6 adding three attackers under this one focal point here But white doesn't see it, and he plays knight f3. And now Anderson finds a beautiful mate in five, which I'll again give you a moment to pause the video to see if you can find it. So the mate starts, the queen takes b3, immediately sacrificing the queen and threatening queen b1 mate. So a takes b3 is forced, and rook takes b3. Now the rook is now stopping, is now threatening an unstoppable mate on b1. Johannes try, tries to save himself by giving his king a little bit of air, hoping his king can escape this way by playing bishop e1. But now bishop e3 check, and the queen's got no escape square. The king has got no escape square, so the queen has to take the bishop. And now rook, oh no, rook b1 mate. And you see now why Anderson played this rook to d8 to cut off any attempt by the king to run away. So that's the game. It's a beautiful game. Um, it's worth noting at bishop e3 check, this is when Rohanna's resigned because he could see that mate was unstoppable. And this is the first game of the book, and it's really quite a nice game it really shows just how powerful a leading development is like at this position we immediately see that actually the only black piece which isn't currently attacking is this rock all of black's pieces are developed they're not quite in a perfect position like as we see this bishop needs to go to d4 this rook needs to come to d8 but 
they're all developed. And Ellison uses this to move his pieces into position with tempos. Again, with tempo. And here, it is with a tempo. He's threatening mate in five. And Johannes misses it, and he loses in a spot. And you see that actually, although in this position, Johannes did finish development, essentially, other than this knight coming out, so he's, he's almost fully developed as soon as, as soon as this knight comes to F3, Johannes is fully developed, essentially. The rook still needs to come out, but he's technically pretty much finished his development. But Anderson's got the time now to improve his position, use his developed pieces to create tempos on the king, stopping White from ever having chance to bring any pieces to the defence of the king, from ever finishing his development. Anderson's pieces are developed, and he's simply improving their position, threatening mates on every single move. It's a just truly a lesson in initiative and uh, tactical combinations and the importance of development. And the next game I think is very similar to this one as well. It's very much a tactical game. It's full of combinations. And um, Rethi does write that over time Anderson actually changed his uh, own playing style to be more positional, which we'll hopefully see in the third game. But for now, I'll leave it there, and I hope to see you all on the next game. Thank you for watching. If you did like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you've got any suggestions for how I can improve in the future, anything you want to see, please drop a comment in the below, and I'll gladly take your feedback on board. Thanks for watching.